during both a full moon and a new moon, during solar eclipses and lunar ones, the Earth, Sun, and Moon are in near-perfect alignment. They are in syzygy. In astronomy, a syzygy is when three celestial bodies align. Humanity has been fixated with syzygy for millennia, endowing these moments of alignment with a variety of cosmic and personal meanings. In 1184, a famous letter, supposedly originating from the University of Toledo in Spain, predicted the world would come to an end when the planets aligned on a certain date in 1186. The dreaded syzygy arrived on time. The Armageddon did not. But the perception of syzygy as an apocalyptic omen stuck around. In Jungian psychology, a syzygy is a symbolic pairing of opposites the yoking of opposing images. Jung believed that when it appeared in dreams, the syzygy signaled the internal communication between the unconscious and the conscious, an intersection between the surface level and the hidden realms of the mind. Finally, the Super Bowl has come back to Los Angeles. In February 2022, during the Super Bowl broadcast, Meta, which had until very recently been known to the world as Facebook, premiered a cinematic commercial for its Oculus Quest virtual reality system. The ad featured a band of animatronic creatures led by a singing dog, happily entertaining hordes of children at Chuck E. Cheese-esque pizza parties set in the 1980s. Abruptly, the ad's vibe takes a turn for the worse. For reasons that are left unclear, the pizza parlor shuts down and is scrapped for parts. The robotic musicians, who moments before were gainfully employed in a joyous community, are forcibly separated to be sold off individually. We see the band's shaggy lead singer spiral out, neglected and abused in a lonely world which has no real use for him anymore. Until, miraculously, he's saved by a futurist who installs him in a science center where a group of puckish teens put a virtual reality headset over his eyes. And here, the story comes full circle, and the tragedy of modernity is resolved inside the metaverse. This ad, officially called Old Friends, New Fun, puts its finger on a real problem, a current day widespread malaise of alienation, loneliness, atomization, obsolescence, underemployment, and appears to prescribe a treatment, a magical circuit that leads us back to youth and belonging in a frictionless virtual world. The old world is dead. Long live the old world. On its surface, Meta's commercial seems to glide over the question of why exactly these workers, as proxies for us, the global Super Bowl audience, have been made obsolete and powerless over the direction of their society and their own lives. Things are out of control, and the reasons for that are not worth mentioning. The omission itself implies a story of natural and inevitable processes, the irresistible forces of history and cultural evolution. Of course, these 1980s workers, who relied on a shared physical space to earn a living, are obsolete. This is simply a given. However, nested inside this ad and its comforting imagery, in a place deeper than subtext, perhaps we should call it the corporate subconscious, a commercial dream realm from which meaning bursts forth against the will or intention of any board member, PR expert, or marketing firm, hidden in plain sight, is a complex and illuminating story about the real causes of the very human tragedy depicted in the ad. Without meaning to, Meta's Super Bowl commercial appears as a syzygy, an alignment of worlds, a yoking of opposites, a touch point between the known and the buried away. Hold on, because it's going to get a little bumpy. In 2014, quietly and without fanfare, Chuck E. Cheese changed hands. The restaurant chain was swallowed up bought by a private equity firm called Apollo Global Management in an obscure but very common transaction called a leveraged buyout. 
When I describe Apollo Private Equity, I think of a place that has an enormous amount of humility and hunger and scrappiness and a lot of grit. Grit? Grit. We don't give up. One of the beloved brands of the 80s and 90s now belonged to one of the least well-known but largest companies on the planet, and our musically inclined dairy rat was in fine company. Other businesses owned by Apollo Global Management include Expedia, Hostess, Hertz, Kodoba, Verizon Media, Coinstar, Shutterfly, Yahoo, Smart and Final, Rackspace Cloud Computing, Sotheby's Realty, Jacuzzi, the Naranda Mining Company, and the private military contractor Constellus, formerly known as Blackwater, among many others. Most of these companies had also been acquired by Apollo using the same quirky financial tool as they had used to purchase Chuck E. Cheese, the leveraged buyout. But before we dive into the leveraged buyout, let's back up a moment. Because the story of Chuck E. Cheese itself happened to reflect a period of roiling change in America. The founder of Chuck E. Cheese was a man named Nolan Bushnell. Bushnell grew up in Utah, working at a local amusement park as a college student. It was here, at the Lagoon, observing the habits of young people, that a strange and vivid dream took hold of Bushnell and never let go. To start a pizza parlor with Disneyan characteristics, a place where families could eat, play arcade games, and be serenaded by friendly animatronic robots, just like the ones in the Enchanted Tiki Room at Disneyland. Bushnell moved to California to try to get a job at Disney. They rejected him, but he stayed on the West Coast, where, in 1971, he visited a Stanford University computer lab to see the demo of a computer video game called Space War. This demonstration changed Bushnell's life. Sensitive as ever to the habits and commercial desires of young consumers, he saw in this demo the future of entertainment. He and a business partner quickly started a company to develop computerized video games. They named their new company Syzygy. But when Bushnell tried to trademark the name, it had already been taken. Disappointed, they went with their second choice, Atari. With the release of Pong, Atari exploded onto the scene growing at an absolutely astounding rate. This was the marriage of computers to entertainment, and it changed Silicon Valley and the world. What do you think of the game you're playing? I love it. I think this is a lot better than some of the programs they have on TV right now. They're great games. A new archetype was born, the scrappy, hippie, libertarian founder figures, dragging a kooky concept from their garage into an empire with their bare hands. After Atari, Venture capital began to flow into the San Francisco suburbs surrounding Stanford University, and that flow turned into a torrent of moonshot investing, a gold rush that made a new city. And this new shining city, the booming Silicon Valley, became a beacon for the hippies and libertarians looking for a new revolution after the psychedelic 60s had crashed and burned. A personal revolution, in which each person was liberated to create their own world, where the truest and deepest dreamers could get wildly rich. Steve Jobs, who was Atari's employee number 40 in the mid-70s, would build the first Apple computer prototype out of Atari parts. Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pens and keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon, for the wheel's still in spin, and there's no telling who that it's naming. For the loser now will be later to win, for the times, they are a-changing. Now... I'd like to introduce Apple's board of directors. A specific worldview was beginning to crystallize in Silicon Valley, deeply interwoven with the video games that sparked the personal computing revolution. In the experience of these video game designers and the avid gamers, a gateway had been opened into an ecstatic zone of pure merit. The promise of liberated capitalist democracy made manifest on screen. A new space where winners and losers were clearly articulated, where anyone was free to play, and where a clean, causal line could be drawn between your final score and your individual drive and natural abilities, unencumbered by race, class, gender, or history. The rules and limitations of video games were demonstrably equal for each person. The game was exactly the same, each and every time. How well you did depended on you and you alone in the flow of the moment. 
These video games manifested a vision of ideal meritocracy that became a smooth, iconic runway from the collective turbulence of the late 60s to the individualistic, market-based new world peaking over the horizon. Kill or be killed. Eat or be eaten. Each person stands alone heroically to pull themselves up by their bootstraps or to sink in the swamp of failure. This evolution of California's counterculture toward a libertarian digital Darwinism was not isolated to the West Coast. It was just a small facet of a much larger trend catching hold in the United States at the end of the 70s, a new paradigm that bloomed across the length of the continent. The free market enables people to go into any industry they want, to trade with whomever they want. If they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. As massive inflation loomed in the 1970s, a cadre of free market libertarians, financed by business groups like the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable, were on the attack, dominating the public conversation for the first time since the Great Depression and the labor-friendly, anti-monopoly New Deal of the 1930s. Since the New Deal, corporate America had taken a largely defensive posture branding themselves as the builders of society, the makers of useful things, the employers of citizens, the designers of the future, and the glue of American communities. We have invested enough in our business system to provide the average worker with efficient and expensive buildings and machinery to enable him to produce enough in a 40-hour week to earn twice as much as the 1900 worker earned in a 60-hour week. This shorter work week gives us all more leisure time to enjoy a standard of living beyond the wildest dreams of anyone who lived a half century ago. The more we earn, the more our families have to spend for the things they need and want, to build a better life for themselves and their fellow man in the world of tomorrow. Now, however, corporations were becoming more globally oriented much less interested in making useful products or employing great numbers of people. The focus of their activity was starting to shift away from the American consumer and worker and towards the much smaller class of shareholders. And corporate leadership was starting to push the idea that this change in focus was a good thing, an enlightened selfishness to be proud of and even to flaunt. Perhaps the most famous free market economist of the time was the University of Chicago's Milton Friedman, who would go on to be economic advisor to President Reagan. All of us who live in the United States today owe much to the climate of freedom we inherited from the founders of our country. But in the past 50 years, we've been squandering that inheritance by allowing government to control more and more of our lives instead of relying on ourselves. We need to rediscover the old truths that the immigrants knew in their bones, what economic freedom is and the role it plays in preserving personal freedom. In 1970, Friedman published a manifesto in the New York Times, which he called the Friedman Doctrine, in which he scolded corporate executives for talk of employment, social responsibility, protecting the environment, or any consideration of a broader public good. The corporation's sole responsibility, argued Friedman, was towards the shareholders, not the workers, consumers, communities, or countries in which they operated. He called the idea of corporate social responsibility pure socialism. These were persuasive ideas. And as the 70s passed into the 80s, Reagan's administration aggressively deregulated Wall Street and the big banks. The rarefied and largely hidden realm of bankers, investors, and shareholders boldly amassed tremendous influence and concentrated ownership over the economy. As organized labor unions, small businesses, urban centers, and small towns across America were strategically disinvested from and gutted by harsh governmental and corporate austerity measures. This revolution, often called the neoliberal revolution, resulted in the financialization of America, a time during which money, power, and productivity crossed a dimensional threshold away from the physical collective world of places and factories and things, and into a virtual space of pure digitized financial instruments and the technology sector that enabled these light-speed global transactions. 
Think of that little computer chip. Its value isn't in the sand from which it is made, but in the microscopic architecture designed into it by ingenious human minds. In the new economy, human invention increasingly makes physical resources obsolete. We're breaking through the material conditions of existence to a world where man creates his own destiny. We're returning to the age-old wisdom of our culture, a wisdom contained in the book of the Genesis in the Bible. In the beginning was the spirit, and it was from this spirit that the material abundance of creation issued forth. Meanwhile, in the jungle of Silicon Valley, Atari had emerged as the absolute king. When Warner Communications offered Nolan Bushnell $28 million to acquire Atari, he saw an opportunity to finally realize his first and dearest dream. In his contract with Warner, he included a stipulation that Warner would fund the building of one restaurant in the Silicon Valley area to test out Bushnell's idea of animatronic pizza-centered entertainment. And so the first Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time Theater opened on May 17, 1977, strangely as part of the Atari company. Birthday one, honey bun, won't you be our birthday one? Please say yes, don't say no. And we'll tell the world. By now, it's probably no surprise to anybody that we got a birthday number coming up here. Well, it's a surprise to me. I didn't even get a present. Me neither, Big C. That's because it's not your birthday, nitwit. The restaurant was a smash success, and soon began opening up locations across California. In 1979, the brand went national, crossing California's borders. That same year, 1979, as Charles Entertainment Cheese was making his way east into new markets, the leveraged buyout burst onto the scene of corporate America. In Florida, a man named Jerry Saltarelli, the CEO of a machine tools company called Hudai Industries, got a phone call from a trio of bankers with a strange proposition. The bankers, Jerome Kohlberg, Henry Kravis, and George Roberts, who called their budding private equity firm KKR, wanted to buy Hudai, using a loan that they would take out against Hudai's considerable assets and strong performance in the market. KKR would use the loan to buy up Hudai's shares, take the company private, and then offer huge payouts to Saltarelli and other Hudai shareholders. It seemed like an odd strategy to take out an enormous loan in a company's name in order to buy that same company. At the time, it was called a bootstrap acquisition because it was essentially a company buying itself using its own assets, property, real estate, etc., as equity in the purchase. But strange as the deal may have sounded, Saltarelli was ready to retire. He didn't want to sell his company to any of Hudai's competitors, so he jumped at the offer, thinking his company and its workforce would be in good hands. Hudai's top brass got exceptionally wealthy from the deal, and the KKR bankers paid themselves a healthy 20% management fee for overseeing their own leveraged buyout, all of it financed by debt that Hudai alone would be responsible for repaying insulating KKR from any risk. Within a few years, Hudai was drowning in this debt. To pay it off, the bankers sold off every division of the company, laying off more than 2,000 workers, essentially stripping Hudai for parts before finally killing it for good. Hudai Industries died away, but the bankers at KKR, who had orchestrated the buyout with essentially no risk on their part, made millions of dollars in fees, calling it a massive success for themselves, their investors, and Hudai's top executives, who walked away with generous packages. Word spread, and soon, the strange circular logic of the leveraged buyout skyrocketed as a financial practice. As these firms took over business after business, their MO was to impose brutal cost-cutting measures, to wring out the maximum amount of profit from these businesses in the shortest period of time, 
often before bankrupting or entirely shuttering the weakened companies which had been swamped with debt from the leveraged buyout. These were not just failing businesses, but viable, profitable ones as well. Often companies with a strong business model that would have survived had they not been saddled with millions of dollars of debt. Not every leveraged buyout has resulted in this kind of gutting. There are cases in which private equity firms have used this method to rejuvenate and even grow at-risk companies. But studies have shown that these cases are the minority. Most of the time, the so-called target companies of leveraged buyouts whether they're healthy or in trouble, are bound for the scalpel. On average, historically, the leveraged buyout typically results in massive downsizing of jobs at the target company, significantly lower wages, even when productivity increases, and an intense and powerful resistance to unionization from the top. On the consumer side, when your favorite business is bought out by private equity, it's usually also a cause for some concern. When private equity firms buy up for-profit colleges, graduation rates go down, while student debt increases. When they buy nursing homes, Medicare bills tend to skyrocket, along with, sadly, the mortality rate at the facilities, which go up an average of 10% when taken over by private equity firms. And these firms have been gobbling up the healthcare industry with zeal in recent years, where in dentistry, dermatology, hospice care, veterinary medicine, or large hospitals, they've consistently ratcheted up fees and prices while decreasing the workforce and quality of care. Across the American economy, this practice of racking up debt, stripping a company down, and often shuttering it, became one of the engines behind the deindustrialization of the country, the erasure of the middle class, and the outsourcing of labor overseas throughout the 80s and 90s. Fewer and fewer large firms were buying up and controlling more and more of the economy. And while the change in culture and the shifting mores of corporate America played a role, new policies and legislation are what really opened the door to these changes. Thank you. This is a day we can celebrate uh, as an American day. The so-called neoliberal era peaked in the late 90s when private equity firms lobbied Congress to repeal Glass-Steagall, a group of regulations that had been passed after the Great Depression to protect against risky and predatory investment practices. Glass-Steagall had forced investment banks and commercial banks to split apart and to operate independently. Bill Clinton signed this repeal with gusto in 1999, and with that, commercial and investment banks could pool their money and rejoin forces. The Glass-Steagall law is no longer appropriate to the economy in which we live. It worked pretty well for the industrial economy, which was highly organized, much more centralized, and much more nationalized than the one in which we operate today. But the world is very different. With Glass-Steagall finally dead, the money now available from commercial banks opened the floodgates for private equity to go on increasingly frenzied buying sprees that would quietly and invisibly consume ever-growing sections of the economy into the new millennium. By 2014, Chuck E. Cheese was still raking in cash at a healthy clip, with nearly 600 stores nationwide and profits of over 50 million per year. Why then did the board of CEC Entertainment accept Apollo Global Management's offer to buy them out using debt borrowed against Chuck E. Cheese itself. It's hard to know, but the answer probably has to do with the enormous premiums paid to shareholders and executives in the buyout. At the end of the day, it turns out, it's more lucrative to sell off a business to be squeezed for maximum profit by a private equity firm than it is to operate it at a steady but modest profit year after year. So, in debt for over a billion dollars in interest from its own merger with Apollo, Chuck E. Cheese went from making over $50 million in profit each year to losing money almost every year since the leveraged buyout. As in hundreds or thousands of leveraged buyouts since the 1980s, one of the first moves was to close stores, scale back the workforce, and dismantle the infrastructure of the Chuck E. Cheese brand, including retiring all of the animatronic animals that had been the trademark of the restaurant, and replacing the physical characters with virtual ones. When COVID hit in 2020, 
Chuck E. Cheese, still swamped with the debt from Apollo's buyout, didn't have the cash flow or the savings to survive. They filed for bankruptcy and have since shut down a huge portion of their locations. Ever since the neoliberal revolution of the 70s and 80s, the deregulation of finance, the cutting of public sector social services, and the aggressive virtualization of life and the economy, the gap in wealth and influence between the wealthiest Americans and the rest of the population has widened into a canyon as voracious firms like Apollo Global Management have gobbled up and centralized ownership and control of more and more real estate, essential services, and name brands. And since the 2008 financial crash, private equity firms have been drinking deep of the housing market, swallowing up to a third of all single-family homes in the United States, pushing home prices beyond the reach of most first-time home buyers, while steadily raising rents on America's growing population of tenants. Meanwhile, as average people have less access to material property and autonomy than ever before, the tech evangelists of Silicon Valley have proposed a totalizing solution to the crisis, a soothing, immersive universe in which the smallest interactions are financialized and surveilled, and where the vast inequality of the material world is smoothed over by imperious design. This is John Carmack, the former CTO of Oculus, talking with Joe Rogan about the moral imperative of virtual reality. Do you have a long-term vision in terms of what you're trying to do with virtual reality and Oculus? So I do, and it's I'm, you know, it's something that people, some people read this the wrong way and react incorrectly to it, where it's just it is not possible on Earth to be able to give everybody all that they would want. Not everybody can have Richard Branson's private island. There's just not enough private, not enough islands in the world to give them to people. But even on a a much more mundane level, not everyone can have a mansion of a house. Not everyone can even necessarily have a home theater room. And these are things that we can simulate to some degree in virtual reality. In 2020, in response to intense lobbying by private equity, President Trump's Labor Department issued a ruling giving private equity firms access to the money held in 401k retirement accounts, putting even more capital at the disposal of private equity firms while opening up the retirement savings of millions of Americans to higher fees and the risky investments pioneered by these firms. Because of these high fees that the private equity firms charge to manage these transactions, they end up making lots of money regardless while the amount of debt at stake puts both the acquired company and the investors at higher risk of loss. At the time, Biden's campaign called the move, quote, another example of President Trump putting the interests of Wall Street ahead of American workers and families. In December of 2021, just a couple months before the Super Bowl, President Biden's Labor Department quietly opted to leave the Trump-era ruling in place. Perhaps these investments will pay off, and the workers lucky enough to have retirement funds will benefit from the leveraged buyouts that have eroded small businesses and the working class over the past 40 years. And if these risky, high-yield investments don't work out for workers, well, then, instead of the cruise ship or the golf course, there's a place ready for them to go during their autumn years. A fluid, watchful world of light and sound and nostalgia. A circuit back to the beginning, a time before the planets aligned in foreboding, and the world quietly spun out of our hands 